Additionally, before issuing a final enforcement order, the State Water Board must first issue a draft cease and desist order. If such enforcement action is proposed, a water right holder is entitled to an evidentiary hearing on all issues before the board takes, before the order takes effect. This individualized enforcement based system of curtailment in the absence of regulation is cumbersome, is cumbersome and time consuming as, I, as you're all aware um, based on your experience in previous hearings. And so while the State Water Board has existing authority to issue curtailment notices for junior water right users and to initiate enforcement action, we expect that there will be a high degree of non-compliance during the drought that will end up impacting senior water right holders because there won't be water available for their diversion due to the illegal diversion by junior water right holders. Due to the severity of the drought, we expect that large numbers of junior water right holders will, will have to cease diverting statewide to protect senior water right holders. Many of those water right holders do not have alternate supplies of water or only have costly supplies of alternate supplies. And as a result, are likely to continue diverting um, after the board issues con curtailment notices. So that's uh, one of the reasons we, we think the emergency regulation is is needed is to um, address those issues. Further, um, due to the uh, limited penalties and the lengthy process to impose um, any remedy under the existing authorities, um, we don't believe that the existing pr process provides um, an adequate deterrent for noncompliance when weighed against the potential benefits of continued noncompliance. In addition, if a large percentage of water right holders fail to respond to their curtailment notices issued by the board under its current authorities because of the la lack of prompt and meaningful repercussions, um, identification of unauthorized diversions will be very difficult. And, uh, and it will be unlikely that we can do this in a timely fashion to assure the protection of senior water right holders. In addition, currently the State Water Board requests um, that the curtailment, uh, the in with the curtailment notices that parties submit information regarding um, uh, the curtailment certification forms. Um, however, if many water right holders fail to complete the form, at, the board will be unable to refine the information regarding curtailments and will be able will be limited in its enforcement abilities to identify. Um, necessary follow-up actions. So now I'll go over the proposed emergency regulations. Um, the proposed emergency regulations would set drought emergency curtailment methodologies and reporting requirements to ensure the effective and efficient um, curtailment of water rights to protect senior water right holders. Under the proposed regulation, the State Water Board would curtail water diverters and watersheds throughout the state in order of priority as necessary to maintain a reasonable assurance of protecting the needs of senior users and stored water releases that are released for downstream purposes. The requirement to curtail when water is unavailable would constitute both a regulatory requirement and a condition of all water right permits and licenses, certifications, and registration. The regulation also identifies the potential information the State Water Board will rely, rely upon in issuing curtailment notices and clarifies the procedures for contesting and making exceptions to curtailment orders. The regulation would also establish a methodology for water users to propose alternate water sharing agreements similar to the Mill, Deer, and Antelope Creek regulations. In addition, the regulations we require all water right holders to, who receive a cur curtailment order to provide written response with information regarding their compliance with the order, so a compliance certification form, um, with an explanation of any diversions under other water rights and any exceptions to curtailment.
So we believe that the proposed emergency regulations solve both the curtailment and reporting compliance issues that I discussed previously. Um, by providing greater assurance the curtail water right holders will cease diverting and providing greater assurance that those diverters will submit their compliance certification forms. As opposed to the State Water Board's existing authorities that require case-by-case -case investigations, issuance of a draft order or proposed EACL and the opportunity for hearing, an evidentiary hearing, a violation of emergency regulation is itself immediately enforceable by an ACL of up to $500 for each day of violation. This more immediate penalty would be in addition to any fines for violations of a CDO or any ACL for unlawful diversion. It would be more efficient to enforce curtailments under the proposed regulation as a result. This is expected to yield much greater compliance and compliance properly enough to prevent injury to senior water users. So I'll, I'll break for questions. David's also going to compare and contrast these again at the end, um, but right now if there are any questions on um, the proposed regulations or our existing authorities, we can address those at this time or at the end. No, I think that's important because we've gotten, um, thank you for that, we've gotten uh, so many comments and concerns from folks it might be good to try and uh, illuminate the thinking a little bit better as we consider this. And, and I just picked out three things and then I'll defer to my colleagues on other questions because this is the heart of the proposal when it comes to the uh, enforcement uh, issues. One is how are we going to be defining the, the talk about the difference between the basis for the curtailment or how much information we'll be putting out and then how the process would work for a water user if one is a water user and what the opportunity to appeal the judgment or the, the, the notion or the, the, the assertion that there's not enough water in the system for that particular user those two things and then we can talk later about the actual enforcement but one of the issues that's come up is uh, people feeling that in the current system they have this full-on hearing at the end where we have to show the basis for everything we do and so they can see why it is they're curtailed our concern or your concern our collective concern is that that process is so cumbersome and takes so long that we might just do a couple of those cases the summer would be over and we wouldn't have uh, fulfilled our mandate to protect senior the seniority system in the water rights uh, code of california and so um there is a concern that what what is folks uh what how do they find out the basis for it in a way that's clear and where can they challenge that in case they think they're wrongly uh, curtailed um we, ha we have a slide that that compares the oh. the process for uh under our current process and also under the regs that we could fast forward to. We have that a little bit later in the presentation, so we could go to that now. But first I was going to talk, I think your first concern is how do we actually do the curtailment? How do you the do process? the curtailment and how do you share with the water rights mm -hmm. holder the results as opposed to seeing a generic curve for a watershed? How do they know where they fall within it and have a, have a um, comfort may not be the right word, assurance may not be the right word, but the understanding of why it's gotten to them. So let me let me say one thing before Les um, uh, delves into this. Uh, we have proposed a change sheet to the regulation that I hope you have in front of you yeah. that does specify, would specify in the regulation that any curtailment order would include at, at a minimum a summary of the information relied upon in issuing it. So we had heard a lot of comments and we were planning on doing that anyway, but it's a good idea to put it in there so people know it's coming. Uh, so any curtailment order would explain the basis for the curtailment order. That, but that's the first point. Can you describe how it would be explained as opposed to look at the curve on the website? Less. Beyond that. And that's, that's the next few slides. Not everybody speaks curbs. Sure. Curbs. Th that's why we're not. And we won't have the curves today, but we'll have another way of looking at it and give uh, an idea of how we would do this and describe some of the information that we uh, uh, described in the supporting information for the regulation because we have more than those curves. So, if, if you will, I can go through that now and then we can return to the compare. Uh, well, if you're, if you're going to get to all of this, it's fine. I, I just well. want to make sure that for the folks who are listening, they really understand what it is we're proposing and how it differs 
from the current process in a more granular than summary way because sometimes I've, you all know what you're talking about but I'm not sure everybody out there does and there's a lot of misinformation or misassumptions and the a purpose of this hearing is clarity not just for the five of us yep. to understand but for everyone else so that we can have a uh, helpful discussion throughout the rest of the day. That's great. But if you already have it in there, just I'm, I'm fine with you proceeding unless folks want to. No, I just want to um, add my two cents, and I absolutely agree with respect to the issue of clarity and um, transparency with respect to communicating why certain decisions or why curtailments are being issued and the basis for that curtailment. And I see him there in the back, and I gave him a hard time at the uh, the last hearing with respect to the Mill Deer and Antelope Creek emergency regulation, but believe it or not, I actually liked him a lot and a lot. And we actually have good meetings and good discussions. And and one of the things we discussed when we last met was this whole issue of transparency and being more clear uh, about the basis upon which curtailments will be issued. And in fact, in his written uh, comment letter, he actually provided some suggested language. So I was going to ask this later on uh, in the hearing, but as you go through, I I'd like to hear, what, first of all, your thoughts in terms of what you're recommending in terms of providing that additional clarity and transparency, but also at some point today, your thoughts on Mr. Laughlin's suggestion. Okay. Well, I'll just add thank you because I, transparency is the key. Uh, there's a whole list here in the reg as to what staff may rely on. Um, I, I think we're hearing that staff is relying on that information, but we need uh, to, it, if it's transparent, then everybody will know what information we're talking about. Um, I have, the only addition that I would add is that um, if I, I keep looking at the, uh, ch the charts, the supply demand curves, and I look at it and think if I were pre-1914, I have no way of knowing really where I am. On the post-1914, there were cutoffs according to, you know, several different subgroups by year. We don't have anything like that for the pre's or for riparians. And so what I'm looking for, I just keep imagining if I were a water user, how do I look at this and figure out where I am. And if I'm a water user that respects the, sen the seniority of, you know, the system, which I think pretty much everyone in this room and outside uh, concurs with, they may not appreciate the order or the process we're talking about, but I haven't talked to anybody that disagrees, uh, that anybody that has a water right that disagrees with the seniority process. Uh, the challenge is how do they know where they are? And once they know where they are, I suspect that people are going to feel a lot more comfortable. Yeah. This is where I am, this is where my neighbor is, and that's where my other neighbor is. Um, and then the other thing that I'm really looking for is, um, and I understand what you're talking about, cumbersome, the existing process, and um, looking for something that's more efficient and streamlined, um, but that is no excuse for not having a process. And I don't think that any of us are saying uh, any of you are saying that that's what we're looking to do is to bypass due process. So uh, what process protections um, are in place, uh, as the chair indicated, um, to challenge the order? I see there's the you know um, ability to petition for reconsideration, but beyond petitioning for reconsideration of the order, what, in, what uh, process protections are there for an individual um, uh, uh, process for reconsideration for the reg, but then what additional uh, process protections are there for the individual when they get that order? That's probably what you're planning to and, talk and, about, right? And I think, and we've been hearing those sure. comments very clearly, and we agree that we have to put that information together. But of course, you know, referring back to what I said earlier, the, in the unfolding emergency, we find ourselves working on parallel tracks. So this is, this is a tool that we think will be useful, but it begs the question of, well, how exactly are you going to use the tool and what's the foundation upon which you would do the curtailments, everything that you're asking here now. And that's some of what I'm going to be discussing in the next few slides. Okay. But I'm afraid it won't be, it still won't be a complete answer because that's still unfolding. And as it's, but I'll, I'll give at least a flavor for the, the more detailed types of information that we referred to in the supporting information for the regs and how we would be using that because I think it's a reasonable expectation that if you're getting curtailed, it's a big deal. What's the basis for that curtailment? And as David said, that's something that we would, exactly what that would look like will be case by case, but that's something we're proposing that we could add here is that, well, that's something we would be 
providing as part of the curtailment. All right. So, so with that, we'll let you we'll let you continue because you probably well, thought this all through, having read the same comments and talked well, to the same people. Well, I'm afraid these are going to be terribly unsatisfying because of their high expectations, but it'll provide, I think, at least a, a little a little bit more. Okay. So, so here we just wanted to touch on one thing and not to single out any one area, but I think the the question has come up reasonably for those supply and demand curves. It's like, well, and for those of you in the audience that have not seen them, and I don't have an example of those here, which perhaps I should have, but we've been showing those almost exclusively for the basis of curtailment. But to explain them, they're quite simply when the supply curve falls below the demand curve, then that provided support for curtailment. But those are that's a rather coarse assessment because it doesn't take into account lots of things, and it also begged the question, well, if there's been a need for curtailment, why is there still water in the system and why is nobody complaining and it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And that's because it is a relatively coarse tool we've been, that's been based upon uh, reported use. So as you've been hearing in, in our drought updates, it's based on our 2010, the, the last full year of reported uh, diversion in use, and then also the forecasts of full natural flow. Um, but the system is more complicated. There are return flows, there are releases from storage, there's groundwater accretions, there's depletions, there's many more things going on that mm -hmm. mean it's not exactly that. So how can you do curtailments just based on those? Well, the, 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 the reality is that for the more refined curtailments, when we're looking at more detailed information, we wouldn't do it just based on that. We would be looking at other things. But also it's been brought into question, well, how good are those demand numbers? So this is an example here, this table is to look at, well, this is looking at four different sources for demand in the delta. The first one is something called the Delta Island Consumptive Use Model, and that's something that the Department of Water Resources updates, and it's just based on cropping patterns, things like that. We don't have it for 2014, but this is looking at uh, some, some similar dry year type information, or for, tw for 2010, I believe it is, that it shows just generally, we're not looking for a, an exact number, but we're saying are, are the numbers reported in statements of water diversion and use are at least the ballpark. That's the rightmost column there. Mm -hmm. um, then also shown is day flow. That's the, the model that is used, the daily model that is used to uh, account for depletions in the delta that is used to develop the uh, net delta outflow. And then finally some numbers from the 1977 drought. And I, I must dis disclose, although the numbers are all kind of in the same ballpark, they're not exact, there's a little bit of uh, 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 an, an autoregressive component, if you will, that there's kind of some of these, the numbers are might be tied to others, the day flow and the DICU. They actually kind of use some of the same data sets in terms of tuning up and things like that. So there's a reason that they all look kind of similar. But the bottom line is, even though they might pull from somewhat uh, similar source of information, it's the general ballpark because even though I'm, I'm saying on the one hand that we, our methods are coarse in many ways, for some of the determinations that we can make or may need to make, coarse is good enough to know, well, if the demand is something in the order of 200,000, the units here are 200,000 th acre foot, 1,000 right. acre foot rather, so if it's in the order of 200,000 acre foot, we know it's not 50,000 or we know mm -hmm. it's not 500,000 and it's good enough not to get bogged down in. Right, and you don't, you don't uh, do precision curtailments down to the last person. You're doing a kind of a category and being somewhat conservative about it, right? When you say conservative, conservative and that uh, to under curtail or over curtail? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's something that we, we would be we, trying to be hitting it s straight on, but as we describe in the supporting information for the regulation, mm -hmm. this is in practice a very difficult thing to do because once you do a curtailment, if there's a response to the curtailment, that will have, that will actually that will change influence the conditions. what you so do. The feedback. Because so then people so give you better information and you can adjust. Exactly. Thank so this you. Is, so this is something that, that by necessity needs to be refined. An initial curtailment, if you will, will provide some information. The goal would be not to over curtail grossly or under curtail grossly, but to do what we think is needed to protect senior water rights and then adjust it as necessary with the information that we receive. So, so that's, that's one element and it's not necessarily tied to the slide, but that's gonna be part of the process and part of what we describe in the regulation. Before you move so off this yes. slide, um, Les, a question. So say for an initial curtailment with respect to you know one of these columns of demands within these columns do you have enough information 
to estimate relative priorities. And that starts becoming difficult. We have uh, what we have for some detail then, and I'll show you a couple of slides where we have a little bit more detail in terms of what do we have, the reported riparian demand, the reported pre-14 demand, you know, that is filed in statements of water diversion and use. It starts becoming more difficult. We have some information in terms of year of first use and things like that, but it starts, the more detailed you get, it becomes more difficult, but it's perhaps sufficient for within a specific area based on what we do know that we could make a targeted, a reasonable and targeted curtailment. You're asking a question, you can, it will quickly get difficult in terms of, well, what's the patent date of the riparian lands relative to the, uh, the, the first use for the appropriate water right, and pretty soon this starts getting extraordinarily complicated. Right. But if you're looking at the gross numbers in, in the right-sized area that is targeted or is it, that seems to be ripe for curtailment, there may be sufficient information that those details won't be ultimately as important. So, and I don't have a specific example for you here, but I, I just have to concede that we don't have all of that perfect information to sort out every bit. But as the next couple of slides will be showing you, if we know, for example, that the natural flow to which riparians are entitled to, if that's dropping below certain levels mm -hmm. insufficient to meet the riparian demand, right. that tells us something about what may be appropriate in terms of, r of curtailment for riparians. Right. And just to put it in context here, and I don't know if this is the appropriate time or it's at it's, it's some point today, um, in the event that, um, it, just with this example in the Delta, that uh, in Delta uh, diverters are continuing to divert despite the fact that there's not sufficient flow, um, at that point the uh, project stored water would be impacted. Um, and the question would be, what amount of water are we talking about? Just to put it into, you know, uh, the context here about um, uh, the value of the right that's trying to be that we're trying to protect through this order. And I think I'll have a slide. It won't necessarily get at it so much quantitatively, but I'll, if I don't discuss it when I get to that slide, remind me to to mm -hmm. say something a bit more quantitatively about it. But you're correct that in the delta here it is all related. And as you recall, the items when we talked about the drought operation plan, the the temporary urgency change petition order. And there's a plan in there to maintain certain levels of storage in order to continue to protect the delta and provide, you know, you know, to, to achieve a number of goals. To protect all against salinity intrusion. Well, and this specifically, and that's, and that's really that's a you know, and I think we might, in terms of characterizing, I think that that's not that's an overarching uh, concern. I think we all share in terms of maintaining salinity control of the delta. I think everyone, most everyone, would agree <laughs> that that's a good thing to do, and what's needed to achieve that in light of other other competing demands. So, so with that, I'll, I'll try to circle back to that, that comment because I'm, I'm just going to add a little bit more detail in terms of the information that we have and how we would use that and then tie it back to, tie it back to the delta. So this is, you know, this is one of the slides you should never present because it's an extraordinarily busy slide, but I have a good reason for presenting it. And you don't have to try to look at any of the numbers. All you have to look at the boxes, uh, the color boxes, the yellow, the blue boxes uh, uh, and the, the red outlines. What the red outline is showing is the, the entire San Joaquin River Basin and segmented into sub areas. And within each of those sub areas, the yellow boxes are showing the uh, combined demand based on the, uh, the 2010 statements of riparian and pre-14 demand for July, August, and September. So we have, so, so a reason for showing this, we have something more than the cost San Joaquin course San Joaquin River or just, you know, it's like you, we can look at it piece by piece and we can look at it piece by piece in conjunction with in the blue boxes are the full natural flows. Um, but as I said it already, but I'll punch again, that's not the whole story because there's side flows, there's return flows from storage, there's groundwater, surface water interaction, but at least it shows there's more detailed information that we have sub area by sub area that we would be looking at before we would do any curtailments, because you, you can't just look at the one thing as a whole, you have to look at the pieces to see, well, mm -hmm. is there anything that will be appropriately achieved by a curtailment right. of a water right holder in one area, or they're just protecting somebody that, that they won't be able to protect through right. the curtailment. Right, and that is so an issue that's so been raised. So okay. these are all things that we have to think through, and our curtailments, that's why they will get complicated, and linking back, these are all things that we will have to 
share, disclose, this is the information that we have. So this is one piece of it, but it's just with regard to the supply and the demand. Um, uh, what I, if, if you can, s if you can see just one one element, this just calls out the the combined San Joaquin Valley floor and delta demand for July, August, September. And that's where a lot of the demand is, and that links back to the previous, the previous slide that showed, you know, the demand. It's not, it, it's not the same number, not exactly the same data sources, but it's the same, again, not, it's, it's the same order of magnitude. We're not, you know, we, we can't get too bogged, too bog we have to consider sufficient detail, but not bogged down in all the detail. So I'm going to race through the, the next slide because this is showing it for the San Joaquin. And it's again, just now it's just, it's really a little bit more uh, uh, discretized information for that supply and demand. Similarly, we have that for the Sacramento River Basin. And we have this really statewide, especially if you know for the larger basins, we have, this is the type of information that we're looking at in terms of supply and demand. But it doesn't tell the whole story. And What's your first oh. slide? in advance. So, so th it's the reason you didn't have to look at all the numbers on those previous two. This is the summary supply and demand. And this is ultimately what feeds into those supply and demand charts. And it's why those lines cross and why Diane said earlier, referring to what's on our website, this is showing that the total supply, again, the full natural flow, just part of the puzzle, uh, for the combined Sacramento and San Joaquin in July, August, September is slowly going down from 204,000 to 172,000 acre feet per month as opposed to the demand, the full demand, again, also imperfect information, it's quite a bit higher, uh, just under 1,200 Massively uh, higher. thousand acre feet uh, in July, going down to 785, 392 in August, September. So again, it's important to look at that those coarse numbers, and again, they're not, you know, they shouldn't even really go down to 1189. We should be using significant figures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, you know, 1200. If you, but it, it, it gives the, the magnitude of the differences and that we're dipping back down. But then this begs the question of, and I'm sure we'll be hearing, we've worked out agreements, there's still water in the system, and you don't know how to do the curtailments. So what, what are you going to, this isn't enough yet. And I don't and one other item, and I know we've uh, mentioned this in other contexts, but I know some people are listening just to understand what's happening here. Uh, another reason people may see plenty of water going by, and the issue is that could be a senior person's water from downstream, if we're talking about it that way, or it could be project water releases that were stored when the projects had the ability to store, and that's even more senior than senior water rights in terms of protection. Exactly correct, right. and you're and you're anticipating the next. I mean, it's great. You're 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 giving me these questions, and then the next couple of slides well, will. One will one thing, last yep. just to make sure we're, we understand the numbers in that last slide. Um, so you mentioned full natural flow in with respect to supply, but that's they aren't necessarily equivalent, right? Um, when you say so not necessarily equivalent, this isn't looking at, so this isn't looking at, and this is going to be the next slide, this isn't looking at the gauge data. This isn't saying what's in the system, so it's tied to your comment right. that it, it takes into there, account there's the water going by, but it's not necessarily your water because it's a release from project storage or it's return flows from stored water. One of the things to look at, to look, you know, finally is for riparian use, for example, if mm -hmm. there's such little full natural flow in the system in these various areas, does it support any repair and use in certain areas? So that's that's right. the kind of question. Well, th that's, that's, that's relevant. But I just, again, you know, when I see 204 under July, I'm not looking at full natural flow alone. I'm looking at other supply, stored water. No, oh, I'm no, looking that's, at that's just that's, that's full that's natural that's flow. That's full natural so that's, flow. And that explains then what you're trying to explain exactly. in terms of, look, I'm seeing more than that right now. Why is that? Because there's other exactly. accounting going on. There's other sources of water besides the full natural flow. Exactly. And, and you'll see that later. I, I believe John Lehigh has, will have some slides and will be showing something similar to what's been presented before, which is showing you know, how they're tuning up the system and making releases for uh, settlement contractors and for export and also for salinity control in the delta. So there's much more water in the system than that. Mm -hmm. And that really gets at some of the crux of the, the question is like, well, how much water is there available for other water users. Right. Okay. So, I appreciate and you taking the time because numbers, you know, we oh yeah, go, no, th that's they so can be misleading. So. Well, it's it's misleading, but it's somewhat te telling in that. Well, it means that that th th certainly all of that demand cannot be met just with full natural flow. So 
to the extent that you don't have some other source of water to which you're legally entitled to, then you may be subject to curtailment. So, so another piece of the puzzle, and again, this is a, a busy chart, but it's rather just to get the flavor because any curtailments would not just be based on the supply and demand. We, we look out the window, we also look at gauges. We have in the supporting information for the curtailment, we cite to hundreds of gauges statewide that we're now telemetered, that we have a lot of information to tune up our understanding of the various systems. So this is showing it just for the Sacramento River watershed and not even the full watershed. The, uh, you know, it doesn't include the feather, it doesn't include the American River, but it's just so it's just, just including the main stem, Sacramento River, and some of the symbols there, it's showing the telemetered sites so which we have flow information. So we know what's going on between reaches. We know what's coming out of reservoir storage. We know what's happening then getting into the delta. So all of those things can be evaluated before doing a curtailment to determine, well, now we know the full natural flow. We also know what's being released from storage, and you can start doing the math to figure out who would get what water. Again, still with the, the, tough, the tough question in terms of how do you sort out pre-14s, things like that, in terms of, and, and that we don't have, you know, uh, un, uh, except for the priority dates that we have in our records, we'll, we'll use the best information we have with regard to that. We'll use the ERIM system for which we have the priority dates, and then from that you from well, that and then the statements out. that we've gotten now from the yeah. water rights yeah. holders. That's, that's correct. So, so we'll use everything we have at our disposal, which is more than we've been presenting so far in terms of those core supply and demand. Okay. So, so, so finally, uh, and this is, this is now showing um, a year similar though not quite as dry as this, 1931, and this is taken from a document that's in DWR's Water Atlas, which was taken from an EIR that was developed for D1485, and it showed the salinity problem in the delta, the seawater intrusion that occurred in the absence of the projects. So it's showing the extent of salinity intrusion of the 1,000 milligram per liter chlorides, which is roughly equivalent to about 3.5, 3.8, millimoles, and for comparison, our salinity objectives in the San Joaquin River at Vernalis are now 0.7 and 1, so a very poor quality water uh, that is not supportive of, of a lot of beneficial uses. Um, so the point of this slide is that absent the, the tuning up of the projects to release the additional water in excess of demand in the system that occurred at this time, of which demand is, is greater now, then there wasn't enough water to maintain salinity control. So again, that, that links it back for the delta in terms of a principal interest. How do we maintain salinity control um, in the delta? And how do we uh, um, uh, make sure that only those legally entitled to take water are taking it? So that's a, for that, I, I think that's I've been awesome. spending maybe too much time. So I, that's a, if I've answered your questions that you've had previously on the supply demand, that's all I've got on those. So um, so minimum health and safety needs. Um, we, we're not proposing currently the minimum, uh, the, the health and safety exemption in the proposed regulation. We're proposing to not point to it in the uh, regulation. We did adopt a health and safety exemption when we adopted in May for Mill Deer Antelope Creek. Mm -hmm. So today we're requesting comments on whether or not we should include it. Um, the, what, what the, that section has, however, just to describe, it just it creates a process for continued diversion. So um, rather than what Diane described in terms of soliciting information, it says, well, this is some of the, uh, uh, this creates a specific exemption for the things that are listed on the slide. Um, so it has, has a defined process. But it's, it's not just domestic and municipal supplies, it's heavily limited supply. Right. I'm sorry, it's, it's, yeah, it's these other things it's as well. Like it's like 50 energy. gallons per person per day for basic sanitation. It's not whatever a municipality wants, right? That's correct. Yeah. That's there's, correct. There's pretty clear definitions that don't exist without that section. That's right. That's right. Right, but there is um, one of the provisions um, provides that you can go further than the 50 per day if you petition, and that, and let's see here. Trying to find the exact number. 878.1 sub D. And, and 
in the event that someone um, petitions for additional an additional amount, it's unclear as to what standard would be used. To me, as I read through it, if no. you if you're within the subdivision A or whatever it is on the 50 gallons per day, that part seems pretty clear. But when you go beyond, it's unclear as to how how would staff determine or the deputy director how would they determine going over based on what criteria? You're right. <laughs> that that's absolutely correct. Uh, the the goal of well, at, at least uh, on the current proposal that adds a subdivision A, so it would potentially be subdivision D. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it would be C. You're looking at if uh, if if it do, if it is included in this um, package, it, it provides an outlet because the thought was we don't know whether there are scenarios where communities reasonably need more than let's say 50 gallons per person per day. Um, we didn't think that there were, and we thought that the process for getting that minimum amount should be less burdensome than the process for explaining in detail why you need more and showing very specifically the need, the basis, uh, everything you're doing to limit the amount of water that you're using. So there were a lot of commenters saying, why should people get water for watering lawns and filling swimming pools? That's not included in this. Uh, I, I, I don't see any scenario in which a petition for more than 50 gallons per person per day is going to be approved unless there is uh, such drastic conservation that it is achieving the same goals, the same limitations on the end users as the 50 gallons per person per day would. The protection, it may not be satisfactory, but it keeps me awake um, <laughs> when I'm thinking about it, is that we don't have that identified. So it's the board who is subjecting itself to the risk of putting somebody out of order of priority for this reason when they don't fall under the other categories. So we're certainly not going to be invoking that exception lightly because it's not, we don't really get any deference <laughs> on providing people water that's not identified in the other sections. Uh, unless our record is very, very clear as to why it's necessary. So you might so have a hospital or something. Exactly. Yeah, and I'm just thinking maybe it, as, through, as we go throughout the day here, if folks want to comment on that, I'm just wondering if there's a way to kind of tighten it up. And then another area that I've received, and I think we're going to hear some comments on, and that's air quality. Um, as a former member of the Air Resources Board, I uh, absolutely uh, am concerned about uh, the problems with dust and the impact on human health. However, uh, that could be a giant sucking sound. Mm -hmm. And what it, it, no one's petitioned or requested it so far, it seems, from that chart. But um, uh, how, do, uh, how do we determine? Um, I just talked to Charlie Hoppen, and he said that if he were to um, uh, just even um, water his road. We're talking about, you know, 10,000 gallons, not 50. So um, I, I don't know how we uh, kind of um, uh, tighten that up. I, I can answer that now if mm -hmm. you'd like, because we, uh, again, when this was adopted in the first instance by the board with uh, adoption of its previous emergency regulation, um, there wasn't that much discussion of this, but in the lead up to it, we had multiple discussions with the air quality districts and the process that's outlined by what, with, without amendment, would be uh, 871D4 on the current proposed version, it'd be E4. Uh, the ARB or local air quality management district or somebody else with expertise regarding air quality would be the ones who would come to us, not the individual diverter and they would be looking at the minimum health and safety needs scenario, uh, again, modified by uh, the definition of minimum health and safety needs, which, me which says that uh, for which there's no reasonable alternate supply. So somebody watering down their road is not the scenario for which a exemption to curtailment is going to be issued because it doesn't make any difference from a priority diverter standpoint whether 
neighbor A waters their road or neighbor B waters their road if, it's, if all things are equal. So we're not going to be exempting somebody from priority for that. W what we're looking at is the more global, I don't mean global, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, an area identified by ARB or Local Air Quality Management District as having problems without, without any diversion. So if that's absolutely necessary, not diverter A versus diverter B, but without water in this area, there are going to be significant health impacts. So that's how it was but, discussed but with the air quality districts. And you know, I think we could discuss this more if need be. Maybe somebody could speak to it. I, I don't think that the air quality districts we talked to or ARB thought it was reasonably likely that there were going to be many of those scenarios. It was more likely to be that people would request it. I want to water my field down, but you, diverter A watering their field down or road versus their next door neighbor B doesn't provide a basis for that exemption. Does, does that answer your so question? So you're saying it's not to meet the basic air quality goals down the line, but for an imminent health risk. For an imminent right? health risk. Right, that would risk. be the difference. A and and the, the air quality scenario is not one that is really going to be dealt with on a diverter by diverter basis, sort of like grid reliability. Um, well, I think grid reliability because of the, the diverters who hold the rights for those are going to be a little bit different, but it's, it's not really a problem that is going to be solved by one person's diversion. And so it is less likely that we are going to be approving many of those. Yeah, I mean, I'm just uh, a sort of anticipating because I've talked with people that are concerned about this and looking at the language here, uh, this is as necessary to address critical air quality impacts in order to protect public health. Honestly, we are going to have public health impacts because of the drought. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you, uh, you refer to imminent public health. I don't know if we could tighten the language up a little bit more uh, because uh, there's just not enough water to respond to the public health impacts that we could end up having with big dust storms and moving the valley fever spores, you know, throughout the valley. I mean, that is uh, quite possible. So um, I, I hear what you're saying, but when I read this language, again, maybe it's because of, you know, my former work, but critical air quality impacts in order to protect public health, uh, that would be a, a dust storm. If I may, um, Barbara Evoy, Division of Water Rights. Uh, we do have a representative from ARB who's prepared to speak today to the board about that particular issue in our conversations, uh, both with ARB and the Air Quality District. So uh, I think you know she might be able to best answer some of those questions. Going? Should we come okay. back to that when somebody speaks yeah, on that? Yeah, just keep that? keep going because I want to get through the overview for all the folks listening. Just to the f there are people who are just going to be listening to the first part, and I want everyone to hear all of it first before we dive in too deeply on any one thing. Okay, a requirement of the uh, emergency reg package is to do an analysis of the fiscal effects. Um, it's required by Office of Administrative Law. And it's to look at the fiscal effects on state and local government, um, also federal funding of state programs. Um, it doesn't mean we don't have to do a full-blown economic, economic analysis, the effects of the regulation. So it's not going to look at what would be the effects of, you know, the overall effects of a curtailment. Although even there, as I'll be describing, it's not just a with or without curtailment. It's a with or without curtailment under the regs. Um, so we're also then looking at what are the government agencies that are potentially affected, which consist of the public ag and municipal water districts and also state and local government. So as proposed, the only effect of the only fiscal effect that we identified, which is separate and part of this regulation, would be now that they would be required, it would be the costs of submitting now mandatory reporting forms. So with the same information that we've been asking for, for which we've got that low, you know, relatively low response rate, now it would be required. So what is the cost now just to public agencies of filling out and returning that form? So using our database, we determined the number of agencies and we determined a number, uh, the amount of time it takes to fill out the form to come up with a total cost of a little over 300000 so, and there would be uh, uh, um, 
uh, no effect on state and local governments or federal funding of state programs. So that's the, the full cost. But what we also did, because we know that the exemption for health and safety is also being considered, we now this next few slides are to look at if we brought back in now the exemption for health and safety, what would be the fiscal effect of doing that? And it would have, uh, it would be uh, two types of effects. What we would be doing is we'd be having to add additional curtailments, basically. If you're going to provide for that exemption for some block of water, then that water will, will go away from other water users. You'd be dipping lower in the curtailment, and some of those would be uh, state and local agencies. Um, so to do this analysis, we assumed just how many people in the state uh, rely upon surface water, don't have storage, don't have groundwater, and this is a, a we think a, a high estimate that it's upwards of 2.6 million people statewide, uh, and at 50 gallons per person per day for the duration of the uh, reg, 270 days, that's 110,000 acre feet. So that's how much deeper we think theoretically the curtailments would dip for uh, for the drinking water component. The um, the addition of curtailments would then affect ag and municipal users and also public private diversions, but we don't ac account for the fiscal analysis to the public and private. Uh, we assumed then in this analysis that the agricultural revenue losses of about uh, $1,100 per acre foot, uh, estimating it for tax revenue impacts only. And all of this is based, if you recall, we, I, we had some discussion of this in our May workshop. This is based upon uh, work that's being done by UC Davis economists that, uh, for, for uh, trying to come up with statewide uh, statewide cost estimates. Um, so, what then you'll see in the next slide after this is a table that that summarizes the two things: the the effects on public ag and municipal agencies, both in terms of reduced water sales and also revenue losses, and the same for state and local government: the net change in tax revenue. Um, um, uh, from water sales and also tax revenue from ag production, from mm -hmm. crops. So a nice tabular form, and it's interesting here because we're, we're talking about if we were to add the health and safety exemption, and this is showing both positives and negatives because for um, the curtailed agencies, it's going to result in additional cost because there is lost water sales revenue, there is uh, replacement and other costs. That's why you see for curtailed agencies, minus 7.9, minus 6.8. But it's offset by the exempted agencies. If you're the public water agency providing municipal supply, you actually are not going to lose now the water sales revenue. You're not going to have the additional cost. So there's a, there's a net effect. More. So, so, so going through the same, hmm. the same logic for the state and uh, local government tax revenue, there is a negative effect on the curtailed agencies, but a positive effect, if you will, by having a, a negative negative. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a question here uh, because it, I'm a, it, it, is, it is confusing. Um, earlier, way toward the beginning, <laughs> you uh, had a chart that said that uh, there, the actual decrease in the amount of water, I think is how I read it, uh, was, it was roughly 7 percent. It was, it was quite small. Uh, because people move to other sources, which they are I encouraged to do. Mm -hmm. And so won't that same kind of, of, particularly for health and safety, I'm assuming that a town who has some other source of water for health and safety is going to not have any. is not going to have a health and safety problem because they are going to take care of that from the alternative. Yes, it, that, and that, and so how are, how are we? That that was assumed here. It wasn't taking all of them. It was assume, It was just taking the ones that would have no other alternate supply. Uh, okay, so, so is, we have uh, so two point six million that don't have another no. alternate. I think it's a it maximum estimate of what it could be, and it, all of these numbers, I think, reflect what we believe would be maximum numbers and not actual estimates of, you know, okay. not, you know, we wanted to make sure that we captured the universe of potential impacts that may occur. So I think, you know, that's maybe what you're getting caught up on is that we, we don't have precise numbers um, yet. We don't know exactly how 
any all of these curtailment situations will play out so we've done a, a you know envelope analysis that it will fall within the range that we've looked at but you were right on point that the uh, emerg the minimum health and safety exception only applies where there's no alternate source available so this analysis is only looking right. at uh, those groups and that includes no alternate source, uh, no ability to purchase it from another more senior water rights holder. Absolutely. That's that would right. be the most obvious. That's an important point, source. I think, for folks who are going to be listening for Because right. that is the traditional way that juniors get water when they're cut off. That was raised as comments uh, in the last workshop and when the board was right. considering this in the first instance for the <coughs> to accompany the Mill Deer and Antelope Creek uh, emergency reg. And f because there were only a few comments on that. We didn't delve into it, but the the limitation is no alternate water source available, water supply available, and like you said, that is the most common and expected alternate water supply. That's the regular process. There's right. no need to exempt anybody from th w the priority system that they would otherwise be under when they can pursue additional supply under that system. So, so this is a high-end number, so that that total then the net cost to curtailed or agencies, which assumes the relatively high amount of 110,000 acre feet, then would be a net of about a $20 million cost to the additional agencies that would then be curtailed, mm -hmm. okay. and and with a net benefit for the same amount mm -hmm. for those municipal agencies that now wouldn't have to rely upon all you know wouldn't incur costs otherwise but but all the points that we just discussed are well taken it's like these are these are i think high uh, high estimates of what it, what it would be okay. for both both tracks good all right so with that i'm going to turn it over to david this is returning to the slide that uh, that we or really comparing and contrasting the the with and without assuming you still have questions on this <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's, for, it's for everyone so. right uh, so as Les said, this is a, a very simplified chart uh, showing the curtailment process under the existing curtailment process where we're issuing curtailment notices and then the process under emergency regulations. And the, the categories that you see there, um, effect is fairly uh, obvious, but opportunity for input challenge, the enforcement, and then the potential penalties seem like the ones that people were probably most interested in the, the the due process issue that's opportunity for input challenge and then what it means uh, you you had had some questions earlier about w why are we doing this why is the emergency regulation going to speed things up and actually have an impact so i'll get into that um, on this chart uh, unless you have questions on the effect part it, well, I'll, I'll be getting to that by painting the whole picture. Yeah, but you need the whole picture to yeah. actually understand the, the, the due the process it, issues. The effect is more the the uh, the overall general picture of it. But um, to to start with, I think enforcement is probably the 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 first one because people were first and foremost asking about why this would speed up the availability of water to other people, why we're doing this even without complaints, and. The, the process that we currently go through is if somebody is diverting water either without a right or the water is no longer available, it's an unauthorized diversion under Water Code Section 1052, or it's, a wa it's an unauthorized diversion if the board determines it's an unauthorized diversion. So what the board has to do is issue an, a, a draft administrative civil liability complaint or a draft cease and desist order at which time the person who receives that, individual by individual for the most part, can request a hearing. If they request a hearing, they're entitled to an evidentiary hearing. The board holds a hearing, the board takes evidence, the board decides what it wants to do, and either it does nothing or it issues an administrative civil liability, an ACL, which is a penalty for past violation, or a cease and desist order, which tells somebody not to dis uh, divert going forward, or both. Once that order is issued, it is a final order enforceable um, by the board or in court. Until that's been done, there's been no definitive determination that somebody either has to cease diverting uh, or, uh, or a penalty is, is appropriate for that diverter. So you have to go through the full evidentiary process before you determine and can actually stop somebody from diverting. 
That's the existing process. If you issue and what's the timeline on that? Slow. Well, but you know, months, weeks, years. Uh, it's not the normal scenario, although I have a hard time saying what the normal scenario is, but there were prosecutions for cease and desist uh, of some diverters in the Delta that occurred uh, more than three years ago for which there's no order. That's a little bit different simply because there were a number of different uh, prosecutions for diverters in the Delta and so the time scale, people. right, so from a practical standpoint, the time scale of that kind of process gets us into months, maybe years, whereas the, you know, the, the effect, the, the, the action that is contemplated and its effectiveness is on the order of days and weeks and months and is, maybe months. Yeah, months is a fast assumption for. <clears throat> so I think that's the main point here is that there's a process in place. It's a due process, but it's very lengthy. And if the, the desire publicly is to have a system that enables, you know, more of a real-time management of the situation, there's a bit of a disconnect that's on an order of magnitude. There is. Although we could meet every day. <laughs> and I mean, and we weekends. Could. You could weekends. meet every no. day, but the, the noticing requirements, somebody has 30 days from <laughs> receiving a draft cease and desist order or administrative civil liability complaint. They have 30 days to request a hearing. The board has to then schedule a hearing, which also takes some time. Right. Um, and that, you know, that all makes sense, but in terms of having a real-time responsiveness, it, it creates challenges for us mm -hmm. if, there's a, if there's a complaint and we're trying to react. All right, if well then explain the, explain the process that you're proposing. Because so the concern is that folks won't have their day in court, so right. to speak. A absolutely, right. so the, uh, just to finish up on the current process, it, it at minimum takes months before there is an enforceable order which uh, somebody is clearly required to comply with because it's an order, not a notice. The change that the emergency regulation makes is that the curtailment order versus a curtailment notice is immediately enforceable. That doesn't mean it's immediately enforced. That doesn't mean there are immediately penalties or that they will be determined to be X, Y, or Z penalties. There, there will still be an opportunity for a full evidentiary hearing before any dollars, any administrative civil liability is imposed. Mm, but okay. you start from the place of having an enforceable order which is much clearer that somebody needs to actually comply than the notice. That includes both the reporting and the requirement to divert. So that gets into, and I don't want to gloss over this or go too fast, so I'll come back if you need to, but the jumping ahead to the opportunity for input or challenge, which people were likewise very <laughs> concerned about. <coughs> Under the current process, nobody needs to challenge a notice of a, a notice because they don't have to comply with it, unfortunately. What the notice says is that there is no water available for you. You really should take notice of this because if, you're, if, if the board goes after you or a court goes after you, a, a DA, uh, the AG's office is who we'd normally refer to if we don't do it internally, goes after you for an unauthorized diversion, you are susceptible to these penalties. If, so there's, the, there's those ifs. With the, with the order, then it is immediately enforceable but, like all board orders, it is subject to reconsideration. So people do have the opportunity, as soon as it is issued, to request reconsideration of that. And, you know, staff certainly expects that, A, in putting together all of the information in the order itself, that, that is in the change sheet, uh, that people will know, and this is a, the first prong of due process, people will know the basis for the order against them, and that is, that there's no water available. Um, if there are mistakes to that, the board has its regular authorities to reconsider on its own motion or under a petition for reconsideration, either of those within 30 days. I imagine if there are mistakes, then those will be addressed way sooner than